is Elijah Murdoch, and I want to thank you for coming here and having a quick listen about why we're painting this mural today. I'm from a place called Serpent River First Nation, which is an Indian reserve located on the north shore of Lake Huron. And for many indigenous people, the Thunderbird it represents the natural law of the land. And so for thousands of years, indigenous people were able to live on this land in a sustainable economy without destroying the earth. And how they were able to achieve that was that there was no difference between economy and ecology. So they, they understood that to have a strong economy, you had to have a strong ecology, and that they worked hand in hand. Because of course, that's where you got your life from, was from the land. And there was no difference between the two. And it was the Thunderbird <coughs> is the one that gave us, I guess, those instructions or gave the indigenous people that knowledge of how to live here on these lands uh, with, you know, in balance with Mother Earth. I remember when I was a child, we used to live in the forest and we were a free people in the forest. We had our own government, we had our own laws, we had our own way of life, and we were a free people. And the government of Canada did not like this at all. Um, the government of Canada thought that this was the Indian problem. As long as that there was a free people, you know, living their own life, believing what they wanted to believe, they were going to protect those lands. And of course, as Anishinaabe, we were protecting our lands. Because it's built right into our culture that we have to leave the land the same way that we found it. We can't change it. And so the Canadian government viewed this as a problem because they wanted to have a, a free-for-all and resource extraction in the territory. So they created something called the Indian Act, which, you know, which ended up being the forced removal of Indigenous people from their lands and into colonization. And so when I was five years old, I was apprehended uh, by the Canadian government, my, my brothers as well. And we were taken away from our, our parents. We were stolen away from our parents, uh, simply because we were Anishinaabe. We were indigenous. And we weren't allowed to live with our parents. It was law that we could not live with our parents. And the reason why they did this was because they knew that if we were raised by our parents, we would have an indigenous mind, that we'd want to go back to the land. And so they had to disconnect us from that land. And so what they did was they tried to disconnect us from our history and our parents. And that's exactly what they did. My daughter is six years old. She's this big. And she's the first child in my bloodline to legally be been allowed to have been raised by her parents in 120 years. The Canadian government has, has been apprehending Indigenous children for 120 years. And the free-for-all and resource extraction, of course, took place, causing a massive ecological collapse in our territories. And, you know, right now, as Indigenous people, we're really questioning, um, you know, what do we do now? Just recently, um, the Canadian government has openly announced and, and stated that the Canadian state has been active in providing the genocide for Indigenous people. And so this is the first time in Canadian history that they've actually said it. And they said it like three days ago. And they're saying that the genocide has occurred and it's continuing to occur. And it, of course it's poor lands. And so a lot of people will say, well that's, how can that be? You know, how can there, how can there be a genocide against Indigenous people? So let me just write some numbers by you. For every one Canadian woman that is murdered, there are 10 Indigenous women that are murdered. For every one Canadian, that young person that commits suicide, there's 14 Indigenous young people that commit suicide. For every one Canadian that's thrown in jail, there's 12 Indigenous people 
that are thrown in jail. That's where the genocide lies. For every one Canadian that is apprehended by the Children's Services Act, there's 10 Indigenous children that are apprehended by the CAS. We're only 5% of the population. We're only 5%. Those numbers are staggering. 10% of my, my tribe's population is in childcare right now. 10% of my entire population is in childcare. The free for all resource extraction continues. The Indian Act that facilitates all of this is still in place. And of course, the ecological collapse is getting worse. And so the Canadian government uh, was, of course, pressured by Indigenous people for the, for the, you know, ever since Canada became a country, they've been pressuring the government saying something is wrong, something's not right. And so the systemic racism is built right in the system against Indigenous people. And you probably don't see it down here because this is a very multicultural space. And so you probably don't see the racism um, as much as you would say where I come from, where it's primarily just um, non-natives and indigenous people. And so you, the racism where I come from is very strong. So all my life I've heard stuff like this. You're no good for nothing drunk and Indian. You're lazy, you, don't, you can't look after your children. You're a stealer, you, you, you steal things. Get a job, you know, da 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 da, all you do is drink. So that stereotype is the same thing that my dad heard. It's the same thing that my grandfather heard. It's the same thing that my great grandfather heard. I often wonder, what would happen if there was something called the Hindu act? or the Negro Act, or the German Act, where a sector of Canadian society was forced into uh, a racial situation for control. There would be an uprising on the streets. People would shut down the country. There's no question. And, and they should, because that's, that's not right. Did you know that South Africa, the governments in South Africa, actually came to Canada and they met with the governments here and they implemented the Indian Act in South Africa as a way to control the black populations in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela fought against that and was thrown, was thrown in jail. Even Hitler used the Indian Act as a way to control the Jews. So you had the African tribal card, which every black person in South Africa had to have. It had a number, it had a, a name, a picture. Hitler also issued these for the Jews, which was, again, a picture, a name, a number. And Canada had did the same thing for indigenous people, which is called the Indian status card. There's only one of those left in existence. The Canadian Indian Act is still in effect in Canada. And there is no outcry for justice and people are not shutting down the country. Simply because we need more education and simply because the Canadian government still benefits from the theft of Indigenous lands and the oppression of Indigenous people. There is huge differences right now with First Nations people and the Canadian government regarding lands. The indigenous people want to protect the lands. They want to stand up for the lands. They want to make sure that the waters are pure. And the Canadian government has failed miserably um, to ensure that these protections are in place. Um, in my territory, there was 11 uranium mines that were, were put into the ground and our territory suffered a massive ecological collapse due to 140 million tons of radioactive waste that spilled into our river. It has a lifespan of 500 million years. And it'll, it'll never be the same. 
the very lifeline that brought us into the forest, that brought us to cultural security, has been poisoned forever. And so, we never had drinking water. My daughter has never known what it's like to drink water out of the tap. There's over 50 First Nations communities just in Ontario that do not have clean drinking water. If there was a non-native community that did not have clean drinking water, it would be fixed within weeks, if not days. It's unheard of that non-native communities don't have clean drinking water. But it's a regular thing for First Nations, we simply just don't have it. And so when, when I was asked to do the mural, I thought, I want to talk about the natural law. I want to talk about the laws here, on this land. The Anishinaabe people are still here. The people that once were on these lands freely are still here. And I think it's important to share a part of our history and a part of our culture and knowledge, you know, so that everybody is able to see it. Because it's part of your history too, because you're here on these lands. And I think it's okay to celebrate the Indigenous people that are here. We're not a thing of the past. We're, we're, we're multiplying like rabbits. Um, there's, you know, there's going to be millions and millions of Indigenous people, you know, in the next 20 years. And so the Indian problem is not going to go away. We have to figure out how do we coincide with each other and with nature and make sure that the future generations always have a, a good, clean environment. For us, the Thunderbird represents that. For us, the Thunderbird represents that balance that we have with Mother Earth. The Thunderbird represents our languages, our understanding on how to live here and to leave it the same way that we found it. And so our, my people always painted those Thunderbirds on the rocks wherever they went. And of course, around the Great Lakes, there was thousands of, of pictographs. They called them Musnabiagana. The sacred pictures. They painted it with red with red paint. And they left that mark in thousands of different places as a constant reminder that we have to live within the natural laws of these lands. And that if we don't, we will not survive. And so I thought the Thunderbird would be very fitting as a reminder that we have to uh, you know keep ourselves in check, that there's a greater force that's here that Mother Earth is very powerful, and that when we live right with our mother, and we treat our mother with kindness and respect, that it, it also gives us the same, and that we can pass on something beautiful for our children, and that we have to, and that, that means that we have to change. Canadian society needs to change. It cannot continue the oppression and the genocide against Indigenous people. And right now, in the Canadian legal framework, there is absolutely 0% land that's recognized by the Canadian government as Indigenous land. So out of all the land in Canada, 0% belongs to Indigenous people. And we had treaties. We had understandings that we were going to coexist. That did not happen. And so I, I want to just offer the gentle reminder that when you see Indigenous people rising up and demanding equality and justice, you know, stand with them. You know, fight with them. Believe with them. When I was taken away as a child, there was no Amber Alert. Nobody called the police. Nobody did an investigation, and I was stolen from my parents. And, you know, I often think about that. If my people were to come into Toronto and steal children because of their race, because we thought they weren't good enough and that we were trying to make them better, the police would be called, and an Amber Alert would be alerted. And rightfully so, because you don't steal children. That's, that's wrong. So we, we, we're still wanting the justice. We, we're still looking for the equality. 
And we know that right now, that the way resource extraction is happening in our territories, that they simply just don't know what they're doing. They do not know how to live with Mother Earth at this time in our territories. The excessive mining, the clear cutting, the constant need for resources and they're stripping the lands bare. We are in a time of abrupt, irreversible climate change. The world is suffering a massive ecological collapse. We are in it right now. But it's not too late to change. It's not too late to find the good in people and to find the good in nations and to help lift them up and to believe in each other and to look past our differences at the same time as celebrating our diversities. Don't fall into the melting pot. Speak your language. Sing your songs. Know your dances. Celebrate the, the best parts of your, of your culture and be proud of it because the world needs diversity. Part of the problem is that, you know, the globalization of Western education is wiping out systems all over the planet. It's wiping out culture and language and stories and histories. So don't let go of who you really truly are. Be proud and celebrate. Because when we do that, we always find ourselves back into a place where humanity needs to be. And so I want to thank you for, for listening to me. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and, and please ask a couple of questions. Yes, in the back. That's a really good question. So when they talk about natural laws, the old people always said, nobody was to dig deeper than a hand width. And the only way we would dig deeper is to bury our dead people. And that we have to live our lives above the ground. They always said the power underneath the ground is too much for us. And that as human beings, we can't handle that power. It has to stay in the ground. So during the treaties, that was one of the conditions was that, or one of the laws, is that nobody was to dig deeper than a hand width. Because they believed that, that beings lived underneath the ground and if we, if we took their power to the top, it would destroy the earth. So that was a natural law. Another one was that every water, every waterway on Mother Earth, that you had to have at least the length of six human beings on the shoreline, undisturbed and that you couldn't disturb the shoreline. And this was so that when people were traveling, animals alike, that they'd always have a place to be on the shoreline. Another thing that they said too was that we, had, we couldn't have too much stuff. That if we, we could only have as much stuff as we could carry on our back. The old people lived their lives like that. I remember growing up, we never had a garbage can. And we traveled from lake to lake, and we carried our stuff on our back. That's all we had. We weren't allowed to take anything else. And so that was a natural law too, that we couldn't overconsume, we couldn't have more than somebody else. And the most important law was that we had to give our offerings to the land and to each other. And that we had to celebrate each other. And, and make sure that we give all constantly to the people and to the land. And that was the, the main one. And so our people were very humble people. They looked poor, but they were not poor, they were rich. Because they had the land and the land was, was in balance. And that's where the, we believe where the real richness is, is in our ecology. And that ecology and economy is the same thing. Um, I have time for one more question before I go on another conference call. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, comments? I want to thank you for your time. Um, if you, if, of course, if you get a chance, come up and see the mural. And when you see Indigenous people um, standing up for the environment, stand with them. 
Right now, for every one Canadian that is arrested for protecting the lands and waters, they say that there's 87 Indigenous people that are arrested for protecting the lands and waters. We need your help. We need to come together as one people and protect this land so that our young people can have a future and have a life. And when we do this, we instill hope. And right now, our young people need hope. So thank you very much. Thanks for, for taking the time to listen to me.